Welcome, everybody, and thanks a lot for coming to this presentation today. I really appreciate that, given that it's 3 o'clock, uh, you're probably all sleepy. So if you came here because you wanted to find a chair and lay down, feel free to do so. I'm not going to be yelling at you. But if you came here on purpose, then thanks a lot for attending. So this presentation was formerly known as Rest for Real, as you probably saw on the, on the flyer. But then with the passing of the time while I was developing it, um, I kind of amplified the content, and it should be hopefully way more interesting for you guys. So if you came here for the initial presentation, don't worry. The content is still there. I just amplified it with uh, hopefully more interesting things for you guys. Um, but uh, presentation first. Uh, my name is Vincenzo Chianese. I am an Italian software developer, and apart from the Audible photo on the right, I was formerly working for API. Uh, we use it to be a startup building tools for API developers uh, focusing on the design part of the API. And then in January 2017, API vanished because it was acquired by Oracle. And I stayed there for a while, and once I figured it out what they had next to us, I said, mm, I'm sorry, not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to leave the company as soon as possible. And then I left the Czech Republic, and I relocated in Madrid. That is where I'm living right now. And I'm working on the large budget project, and in particular on the Express Gateway. There is the first API gateway written in JavaScript, running on Node and in Chakra, of course. Uh, so those are my references. Uh, you can write me an email, write, uh, read my blog, or eventually tweet me. And I would appreciate if you could do that so my coworkers can see that I'm actually doing this presentation for real. Or if you're interested in tracking down the development of the API gateway, uh, you can check the GitHub account. But I'm going to be talking about that later a bit. Um, let's jump straight to the content. And let me start with the challenge first. Uh, probably here in this conference, on eventually around the web, you probably heard a lot about the microservices stories. So I'm not going to go I'm not gonna go in lot into the details. But basically, we can, we can summarize the whole experience by saying, we know more now. So over the decades of thrown errors and applications shipped in production, uh, the general trend that is, that is emerging now is monolithic app probably are not such a great idea uh, versus, you know what, if we can break up our app and evergreen them into a set of smaller applications in the way we want them to be, at the time we want them to be, based on business requirements or your boss telling you to do something, or even technological reason, like using a different programmable language, and so on and so forth, then we can, again, evergreen those applications in a set of microservices that are independently deployable, and more importantly, isolated. And so that, 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 that's, that's basically the concept. And this is nothing really new, as what's new is old, uh, what's new is old and what's old is new. And it's nothing more than decades of web development practices that converged and coming into this new way of building the software by the big companies. Uh, Amazon, Google, and Netflix, they felt the need of using microservices because having a giant system is impossible to maintain. And although we don't have necessarily the same scale, we can benefit from this new way or, of, of building systems. And also, another reason why the microservices are hiding right is that thanks to the cloud native technologies, if today you want to spin up a new service in your system, you just have to spin up a new container and then Rancher, your container orchestration, Kubernetes, Mesos, whatever you use, is going to figure it out all the details on the networking and communication. But think about it that seven years ago, if you wanted to do a new service for your system, you had to speak. Uh, with your system administrator and say you should configure IES or Apache or engines in order to support the new service. And if you were changing the servers, you had to bring with you the configuration. And on the other hand, today, the configuration with Docker files and all those stuff, it's part of your source code. So it's way easier to move from a cloud provider to another. This is another reason why the microservices are hiding right. Despite all, though, even if you're doing microservices and you're splitting your application into a set of those small things, uh, you should never forget uh, what's the end game of your microservice. Uh, so although you're doing a lot of small things, 
the end game of your microservices system is exposing an interface to your clients into a uniform API. So even if you have a microservice written in JavaScript and another one written in Go, for example, you should not expose two different APIs because one is Go friendly and another one is JavaScript friendly based on technological challenges or, or, or even the kind of the serializer for the JSON payload. Because at the end of the day, uh, your client should be, you should be client agnostic. So I don't even know what the client's gonna be. Maybe it's gonna be mobile, maybe it's gonna be an Angular application or an IoT running on Raspberry. You shall not really care. So, and another, another reason why the microservices are actually kind of difficult is they're an architectural styles. There is no a specification of a good microservice. It's a suggestion, to put it that way. And in order to make you understand better the concept, I bring, I bring you here a real-world example. We do have three churches uh, here on the presentation, and I can surely tell you those are Gothic churches. And why? Because first of all, all of them have a big central window. That's a typical feature of the Gothic things. And another one, the, the central one has a dark roof color, this other one has, the other one has two top towers. And although all those churches are different, as you can see over here, there is a set of teachers that you can see and recognize that it's common among all those churches, but you don't have a fixed specification, like the central window should be three meters long. It's not written anywhere. It should just be big, and you don't know how big. Or it should have a lot of towers, but you never have a precise number. Therefore, it's kind, of, it's kind of hard to say this is a good microservice, this is a bad microservice, and so on and so forth. And that, that can be a source of confusion over here. And if we go back to, I mean, to, the info, to the IT part, there are a lot of ways to slice and dice of microservices, based on a lot of things. For example, uh, services can be defined in many ways. For example, given your legacy code base, you might have problems in splitting the things into, into, the, into the way you want because you have a legacy that you have to carry on. But for example, you can define a microservice based on business capabilities, such as uh, if I'm selling, I have a microservice that, a microservice that is handling the whole part of selling cars and another one that is handling selling glasses or totally other things. You can also define them by domain and subdomains. Like this is a user service, this is the invoicing service, uh, and this is the order service, and so on and so forth. You can also define them by model. So you start from your data and you try to draw a picture uh, of what are your resources, what are the affordances between all your resources, and then going from that, you go down into the microservice, into your model of microservice. All of those are actually totally valid, and if you're are, are at least reasoning about that, you're definitely on the right path. But again, given that it's not a specification, it's a suggestion, there are a lot of ways to craft a microservice. And also another, another point, uh, deployment units can vary. Uh, how many services can I put on an host, and what services? That, that's something that depends, of course. It kind of depends on your use case. So what, what's the thing here is most of the people believe that we can, with microservice you can r remove the complexity and make the things easier. But at the end of the day, you cannot remove the complexity, but you can move it. You can move it from your code and put it on another array layer. That is, most of the times, the network layer. And that's why you need the containers, you need the orchestration software, and so on and so forth. So you can move it, but you cannot remove it at the end of the day. So microservices remove some problems, but you have a total new set of problems to deal with. And today with you, in a very practical way, uh, I would like to, dis to discuss two in particular. The first one is the duplication of the code among multiple services. And the second one is the propagation of server implementation details into the client in a way that it's, it's harming the feature of the client itself. But again, there is a lot more that we should discuss but unfortunately, we don't have that much time. But those are two, are two good starting points. So in order to make this real and really practical, um, I'm going to switch to over here. 
Where is it? But I think I should. Uh, I should probably clone the display or not going to be able to see anything. Uh, and I have an idea how to do that, to be honest. There we are. So uh, can, can you see the screen? Should I probably... How's that now? Is that okay? All right. So uh, just to make you a real live example, uh, I made a super simple application. And it's extremely simple. And it's written in JavaScript. And it's using Docker to simulate the network layer. And it's super simple. Basically, you have a customer, uh, a set of customers that you can query and create, and you can associate to all of them an invoice, and you can query the invoices. So let's have a look to the code really quickly over here. I'm, I'm, do I'm defining a customer and an invoice model, and then over here, I have four endpoints. Get the customer by ID, or get all of them, create a new customer, get all the invoices, couple it to, the, to a customer, and create a new invoice on top of it. Then I'm connecting to the database and so on and so forth. And another important thing, this should be a protected resources. Therefore, I have a middleware here that is checking that each request has a particular header, and I'm checking the key. And if everything is go goes correctly, is then making sure over here that if you are a user, you can query something, but you cannot create something over here, checking user and admin role. And same goes with the invoices. So I'm going to spin up this application, which hopefully should take a couple of seconds. And also, on the other hand, I have a client. It's a, it's a, it's a command line client. And it's extremely simple, this one as well. Uh, it's just over here. Uh, let's go to the top. It's showing list customer, create customer, and so on and so forth. And then it lets you explore the thing. So let's try, it if, let's try it live really quickly just to show you that it, this thing is working correctly. So I should type my API key, and I'm going to use the user. And you can see that I can list the customer. This is, this is the list. Uh, I can list the invoices, selecting a customer in particular. But if I do try to create a new customer with the user key, uh, it's telling me an authorized. But on the other hand, if I use the right key, uh, Again, it's now working correctly, and the new customer is over here. It's pretty simple. And let's say this application has been working for decades. But then your boss came to you and say, uh, you know what? Invoices and users should be two different services for business requirements, because it's more cost effective. You don't even know the reason, but let's say you had a good discussion around that. And it's a good thing to divide this thing. So let's make it live. Uh, I'm going to open another thing, and I happen to have another empty file over here. So let's break this thing into two services. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm going to copy those, those requires. Uh, I'm going to connect to the same database. That is fine. And by the way, this is just happening to, s to be the same database. But of course, it can be a totally different data set. I, it doesn't really matter. Then what? Uh, I'm going to move those endpoints over here, right? And although those are two different microservices, uh, the new one should, be sp should still require authentication and authorization. Therefore, uh, I need this thing, checking the role and the API key. Oh, this one, uh, I'm going to copy it, not paste it. And last thing, given I'm here, uh, over here, when I'm trying to create a new invoice, I'm firstly checking that the customer is existing. But now I don't have access to the customer entity anymore. Therefore, I should communicate with the web API that the, that the customer service is exposing. Therefore, what I'm going to do, I'm going to require an HTTP client. And then instead of doing customer.count, I'm going to do axios.get. And and so on and so forth. Uh, now, 
given that we don't have that much time, this thing has been already done in a branch, that it's safe and it's working, and I think it's probably safer to switch to that. Uh, over here, and the code, it's, it's really the same. It's, 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 it's exactly what I did. The only thing I did over here was I already had the, the URL uh, crafted, so I, don't even, I didn't have to remind it. So let's go here and let's say we are now ready and we are now deploying the new microservice. So I'm gonna spin up the new do the, the, the Docker Compose with all my service. And now that it's ready, here we are. I have my client. And let's try it again. Boom, not found. And it's not a matter of the key. It's not working anyway, and I break it. That's why, because moving into two microservices, two things happen, basically, as you can see. This, that's really the real example I showed into, into the slide. First of all, uh, I propagated implementation detail of my server to the client. That it's like, the customer service is now here. It's not in the same entity anymore. There is a totally new URL space. And the second thing, as you saw, the authentication and the authorization logic has been copied and pasted into the second service. Now, now we are using here JavaScript, therefore it's just a copy-paste. But think about if you have a service written in Go or in Java and another one written in JavaScript. In this case, it's not a copy-paste anymore, but it's going to be a new implementation. And let's say you have to handle authentication, authorization, logging, rate limiting, those might be things that you would have to replicate and reimplement every single time and make sure that they behave the same among multiple microservices. This is, this is not really sustainable. So we want to solve those two problems. That's what, that's what we're going to be doing today. And the way to resolve the duplication of code among the services is through the API gateway pattern. And it's solving a lot of things, not just that. So you have a client, and although you probably you're not doing microservices in your, in your organization, you're still dealing with external services. Because if you, I, I'm quite sure, you guys, that if you have to use a map in your application, you don't do your maps on yourself. You use Google Maps, their APIs. If you have to do payments, you don't, use, you don't craft your own APIs for making the payments. You use Stripe. You use uh, PayPal, PayPTV, whatever you want. So you probably you're not doing microservices in your, uh, in your system, but still you have to communicate with public APIs, probably with internal APIs if you're doing microservices, and also partner-specific APIs for particular services. And you need a super glue to do that. And that's what an API gateway does. Um, so an API gateway, is a, it's a centralized middleware because although you're doing splitting your application, you still need some part of them to be shared among your, your organization, such as authentication, security, traffic control, operation, logging, transformation, and so on and so forth. That's, that's one of the tools that we can use, probably, to resolve the copy and paste of shared logic among multiple services. The second thing that an API gateway can do for you is that, um, you know, if, if I want to do, again, our invoicing system and I am a client, I probably don't want to read the customer and then create an order and then talk with the invoice microservice all one by one. It's a chatty conversation, right? Uh, I mean, performance probably are good if you are in the same network, but it's kind of chatty and inefficient anyway. So what an API gateway can do, it can offer you optimized endpoint and collapse multiple requests into a single one, uh, therefore saving the bandwidth. And so let's say, we're gonna see it live later, but let's say thanks to the API gateway, we can externalize shared parts of our system and centralize them into an external piece of software. But we still have the problem that once we split the services, we are basically breaking the URL space, right? Because uh, we have invoice.organization.org and then customer.organization.org. And it's not anymore central API.organization.org. 
It turns out that REST can be a good idea to, to deal with this problem. And there is a lot of misconception around what REST is. So let's, let's go down really quickly. A bit of history, it's, it's actually mandatory. So REST, it's a dissertation published on 2000 feature uh, in the year 2000 by Roy Fielding that, by the way, had another, um, had another speech about the evolution of REST a couple of months ago. So beyond the original dissertation, if you're interested, feel free also to see the new, um, uh, the new, the new talk he had a couple, couple of weeks ago. But uh, sticking to the pragmatic side, a REST, it's an architectural style. It's a set of constraints that you put on your application. And in particular, it's a system that is stateless. So each request has all the data you need to fulfill the request. It's layered. If I put something between me and the final destination, nothing should happen. It supports code on demand. It's a client-server architectural style, but that's fine. And has got a uniform interface. And if you think about it for a second, HTTP 1.1 is actually stateless. Um, it's layered because you can put proxies uh, and it's still working correctly. HTTP has code on demand because you're downloading JavaScript. That's exactly what it does. It's a client server. And does it have a uniform interface? Like we're going to see it later. So HTTP seems to respond to all the requirements. And it turns out that. REST was the rationale for the deployment of HTTP 1.1. So it's, it's not a surprise. It's on purpose. So we still have to see if, the, if we have a uniform interface into the HTTP and so on, and, and the protocol it offers. Um, so first thing that I really want you to burn in mind, I saw a lot of times people saying, REST is about everything is a resource. Uh, please, no. It's not that. It's a set and architectural constraints. So it's, it's not everything, it's a resource. It's a totally different thing. Go back on the uniform interface. So Roy Fielding is also telling us what is a uniform interface. And it has, again, four constraints. And first one, an uniform interface should have a resource into the identification into the requests. And it turns out. Uh, HTTP does it because we do have URIs that is uh, universal resource identifier. We should manipulate resources through representation. Turns out HTTP is one of the few protocols that have a content negotiation mechanism uh, intrinsic into the thing. They should have self-descriptive messages and again we do have headers and payloads so we can pay, uh, put data and metadata and it should have the hypermedia as the engine of the application state. And it's actually true because HTTP, of course, the, the most content type that is returned in the world is the HTML. So ca can we leverage those things in order to make our application client agnostic and not have to propagate those implementation details into, uh, into the client? So if we try to think about the application we uh, we were crafting before in an HTML perspective I would go to some website and then I will get you know what you can list customer you can add customer invoices and add invoices and if you want to do that you should follow that link so let's say I click on the first link and then I will get a list of the customers and then it's telling me if you want to see the details of the customer follow the link then I click on one of it, and you can see the details. And if you want to see the invoices of my customer, follow the link. And again, so the, 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 the a particular feature here is that the only thing I had to know was the initial URL. And then in order to navigate into the system, I should just follow the links and not knowing the URLs ahead of the time. So just follow the system. And you're going to figure it out. And also, let's say that if you cannot add a customer, I can simply remove the link, and my client will not even know that you can do this kind of action. So uh, one of the ideas that people had was, you know what? If we want to make a different client that it's not a browser, let's just download the HTML, 
and then you get the client as a, let's put as a side effect. You can parse the HTML, checking the, the URLs, checking the links, and according to that, shaping your system. That's a viable thing, but unfortunately, it's not sustainable because this is not a real HTML page. The average HTML page is this, right? Because unfortunately, we are coupling a lot of graphic details and user interaction in the HTML. So it will not be really suitable to uh, parse the HTML and then figuring out the links and so on and so forth. It will be absolutely uh, hard. So what will be the, the, the good trade-off? People said, you know what, can't we make it with a more uh, data-centric uh, content type, like JSON? It turns out it's possible. And we have multiple choices. Uh, the first one uh, was the HAL plus JSON. That is, again, the concept of resources and then the links to navigate through your system. But don't worry, we're going to see it live, so don't worry about that. Then there is uh, an, uh, the CDEN by Kevin's Weaver. That, uh, by the way, it's my co-worker now. We are working together. And it supports entities, links, and actions. And the last one, uh, RESTful JSON by Steven Meadzel. He used it to work me, with me back in the time. Um, again, supporting links and resources. For the sake of practical things, we're going to use the last one because it's the most simplest. It's, it's the simplest one. And it's the great way to getting started. Therefore, uh, what are the, the specification of a RESTful JSON payload? Super simple. A JSON object may have a URL property to indicate a link to itself, and a JSON object may have a UR properties to indicate a related link. So let's see it live. Uh, for example, this is the payload that I, was, that I could return. Instead of returning just the ID and the name of surname, I can also tell you, hey, this is where you are. This is where you can go from here. And of course, we can leverage the same mechanism that the browser are using. So you can go back based on an history that you can, ha that you can keep in your client, right? Uh, let's do it kind of live. I'm going to switch to a ready branch uh, because of timing things. But it's super simple, actually. So. What we can do, instead of simply returning the customer object when somebody's querying me something, I can tell you, you know what, if you want to see the invoices related to this customer, follow this URL. You don't have to know it ahead of the time. I could change it because business requirement change, but this layer of indirection will prevent me to break my clients. And of course, this is where you are, this is where you can go. And I can do the same thing for all my payloads. So if I open this other one, oh no, sorry, it's this other one on the right, on the invoice system, again, this is where you are, this is where you can go from here. And if I modify my client to not, uh, to simply do not use hard-coded URLs anymore, but sim simply following what the server is telling me, so showing the choices according to what the client is telling, uh, to the server is telling me, then you can see that here, when I'm doing the things, all the action are happening on a URL that has been extracted from the payload. And the last thing, the, the last glue, the endpoint of my API, is going to be a super simple URL telling me this is what you can do. So if I spin up this thing now, and I try to use the client, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm going to use a credential that I have over here. I can, good, very nice. I think I should probably stop the whole thing. And then recreate this from scratch. And hopefully this time, yeah, it is now working again correctly. So now the client is, doesn't have anything coupled anymore, but it's following the links that are, that are coming from the server. 
And in order to show you that it's something that is really useful for you, let's, let's go again, let's make another step. And let's say, for example, you know what? Your boss comes to you and says, microservices are not a good idea. We have to go back and go back to the monolithic service. At first glance, it may seem, oh boy, that's going to be a mess. Uh, but it doesn't care. Now I'm going I'm to now switch to this branch over here, and you can see, let's close the whole thing. This invoice service, it's, it's empty. The customer service has the whole four endpoints. And what the only thing I had to do was to modify the URLs that are being returned with the payload of my data, and the client will simply follow those links. So I'm using the same, exactly same client. I didn't do anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy again this credential. Yeah, again, the gateway thing. Come on, boy. All right. And this thing is now working. Now it's using a monolithic thing. It's all on one server. Invoice, it doesn't exist anymore. But thanks to the fact that the, what, the way you can navigate through my system, it's not kubelet. It's not in the client ahead of the time. It's returned by the server, just in the same way we d you do with HTML pages. Uh, this client is now resilient. The API, the way this API is built, lets me do a client in a resilient way, which is definitely way sustainable for larger systems, right? And this kind of thing can also be, uh, all, all the things that you will do in HTML can be done using this REST. This is basically REST, URLs and links into your payload. You can do a lot of things into that. For example, um, let's say that for some reason, uh, my invoice service is down. All I had to do, I can just remove the invoice URL and the client will not see the invoice URL. It's not going to let me click on the action, not at all, because the client cannot see the action. Just like in HTML page, you remove a link, you don't know about it anymore. You cannot visually see it, right? So that's, that's really the whole idea. And Regarding the authentication and authorization side, uh, I'm not going to go a, a lot into detail here, but what I did, I basically configured an API gateway that it's now routing all my requests, telling me, you know what, if you want to do get requests that are for querying data, uh, you need to be a user scope. You need to have a scope in the user perspective. And if you want to do post action that are the one inserting the data, you have to have the admin scope into all your requests. And then thanks, thanks to the key out over here, it's actually checking the header. All those logic has been moved away from the code. Actually, my application doesn't even know that authentication is happening because the API gateway is, is doing that for me. And it's, it's, it's really great that, like, spin up a new microservice, write it in Go, uh, don't even think about rate limiting, authentication. The API gateway is going to do that for you. You can assume that then when somebody's coming, it's a valid user in a way or another because there is somebody checking the things for you. And when you have a lot of services, uh, this is actually helpful. So sneak a peek on, how, I mean, RESTful now, it should be, that, that will be the starting point. And the, the, the engine that it's uh, powering the authentication and, the, out and uh, the authorization side, it's the express gateway. And in general, no matter, I mean, API gateway is something that you probably hate. Uh, I mean, I built, a, I built one and I actually hate work on it. And, uh, but it is a piece of software that you must have in a way or another. We decided to go with JavaScript and using express as, um, as a foundation for it. And, well, uh, it has got a lot of features. It's not, not, not just about out and authorization, but you can do rate lim limiting, logging, proxy, JavaScript expression, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't have the time to go into. If you're interested, feel free to check it out. But the whole idea is that you have the Express runtime and the Express middleware, if you're familiar with JavaScript, we enriched it with uh, a dynamic pipeline system based on parameters 
So when the requests are coming in, they are going through your pipelines, checking condition, and eventually executing your, your action, such as authentication, proxy, logging, and so on and so forth. And that, that's the whole idea behind an API gateway. But there are other solutions. There, are, there is Kong, for example, by the guys of MashShape. There is Stick. MashShape is offering another API gateway. And I mean, it's really up to you. And uh, to wrap it up, if you are interested into the thing, uh, installing it and using it is that, si it's that simple. Uh, just one command away, you can get started. I would appreciate if you will try it. For small communities like those one, it's really important to see downloads trending up. And this is the website. We, of course, try to keep updated documentation. We are really responsive on Gitter if, if, if you want to jump it, on, uh, jump it in. And and last quick plug, uh, the Express Gateway is baked by Joyent, by the Node.js Foundation itself, and by Launch Badger. And it's uh, supercharging what you can do with an API gateway and deploying it into, into Docker, Kubernetes, or, or, or your, uh, your favorite framework. Uh, we are in private beta. If you are interested to try it free, of course, uh, feel free to make me up. A uh, couple of references. Oh, those over here, about the Express Gateway. I don't get it. All right. A uh, couple of references if you are interested in both the gateway and the launch budget thing. And that's pretty much my content for the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any question around that. Thank you, guys.